On October 7th, Prime Video hosted a Wheel of Time panel at New York City Comic Con. In true I said I fashion, though, all the members of the cast and crew who were present had me guessing if I heard what was spoken directly correct, even trying to read in between the lines I wasn't sure. So let's take a deep dive in right now and see what we can decipher. Welcome everyone to Dragon Mount. I'm your host for today's video, Tom D. Simone. Thank you for joining us. Please make sure to smash that like button, share this video with some folks who you think may enjoy Wheel of Time content. And if you're, you know, liking it yourself, shoot us a like, leave a couple comments below. Let me know what you think. Here at Dragon Mount, we're sponsored by Tor Books and we have a host of content, really just something for everybody. Go check it out at dragonmount.com. Before we get started, there's going to be book spoilers though really just up to book three and season one of the show, obviously. So if you haven't read those, you know, just go read them real fast and come back. On stage at the Javits Center was TV guide writer Damian Holbrook, showrunner Rafe Judkins, and he was joined by cast members Marcus Rutherford, Madeline Madden, Daniel Henney, and then they were later joined by our very new Matt from Cawthon, Donald Flynn, and Elaine Trackend herself, Kira Covini. Much was said at this panel. Showrunner Rafe Judkins had strong words about the Shaunchen and how they are going to affect the storyline of season two. He spoke about how their arrival upended expectations of book two, The Great Hunt, and how it continued to do the same throughout the whole series. He's hoping to use them similarly on screen, he mentioned, and he also said several times that the Shaunchen are going to sideswipe season two and that all of our characters have some level of interaction with the invaders from across the Arith Ocean. Though what was made evident by Rafe and the entire cast remarks was that Madeline Madden, aka Egwene, is going to be particularly affected. One of the other cast members joined, albeit virtually, Rosamund Pike. She sent a clip to the panel and then later on Instagram she posted it, so let's watch that real fast. In fact, season two sees her even more stubborn. She pushes away the one person who's dedicated his life to protecting her, Lan. In fact, she pushes away everyone who tries to help her. Is that why you're pushing me away? You don't want me to answer that. You know I can't lie. But the truth in I said I speaks is not always the truth you think you hear. How does her ability to twist words affect Moraine and Kyrian? How do you know about Kyrian? Yes, Rosamond interviews Moraine. A little weird, but it was a cute stunt. We did learn some vital information about Moraine and her journey in season two, though how she's going to be distancing herself from the majority of the main cast, including Lan. Similarly odd, though, she's traveling back to Kyrian, more specifically Kyrian the city, not to be confused with Kyrian the nation, which the city of Kyrian is the capital of. Jordan does this a few times. It's confusing. Anyway, we do have a shot of her crying and bathing in what we know is the city of Kyrian now. Reef also calls her Moraine of House Damodred. Damodred being her surname is not something that we learn until much later in the written work. In the show, Moraine mentions earlier in season one that she is from a fallen house. Though in the books, her house, while reeling from the events known as Lamin Sin, her house's standing amongst the other nobles remains mostly intact. Now, no spoilers, but you should be able to find what Lamin Sin is if you want. Her use of the words fallen house, though, here really make me think Lamin Sin has left a bigger stain on her house in the show. Actor Daniel Henney. Oh, man. <sighs> Look at that. I mean, you could bounce a quarter off that thing, but that's not what I'm talking about. Let's see his face. Ah, there he is. So Daniel Henney had this to say while on stage. It affects land directly. And by it here, we're meaning Maureen's inability to channel. So I think it's kind of like anyone in life who has a profound catastrophic moment come into your personal life. I think he finds himself in a place of uncertainty, a very unfamiliar and foreign place to him. And it's a journey of this se in this season for Lan. And it was fun to play because I think being with Maureen for so long, traveling together, searching for the Dragon Reborn, obviously there's a huge connection there. Not only because they're bonded through the one power, but because they've spent so much time together. And I think that everyone knows Lan is a boy with no home, a king with no kingdom. I think he found a home in Moiraine. And when that home is altered, it puts him in a very strange and vulnerable place. 
That is the journey that we're going to find Land on, and it's a deeper dive into who he is as a man. And I think this is going to be a very formative season for him. So I'm really excited for everyone to see it. him being Lan, it being season two, obviously. All right. So yeah, so he spoke mainly about Lan here. But I think what if we take what he said and what Rosamund said, we get a pretty clear picture of their main conflict in season two, Maureen's inability to channel and how it's going to affect her relationship. Now, if you've watched any of the content I've made before, you'll know that my theory here is that she's shielded with a weave of Sidene, which is tied off. And Sidene being the male half of the one power, she cannot see it or sense it. She just knows she can't channel. Tied off not being something that has been spoke about in the show, but basically means a weave of the one power that produces like a tangible function. When the channeler who spun it out leaves, it remains and they don't have to maintain it. So she's first got to figure out that she's shielded and not stilled, then figure out a way to break said shield, which was woven by the second strongest wielder of Sidene in the world. I'm, of course, talking about Ishmael. I feel confident in saying that that's Ishmael now because we have a pretty good confirmation through the season one recap slash season two teaser that they showed. Let's watch that right now. We didn't defeat the Dark One. We set his strongest lieutenant free. He may be waking the Forsaken. You have no conception of the power they wield. Stop all this suffering. Oh. Is to stop the wheel itself. This was shared at the con, as well as on the official Wheel of Time Twitter account. To start, we're greeted by a montage of images, seemingly in a timeline order from season one. Which, if you go and check out Adam Whitehead's article posted on DragonMount.com, you'll see that we also posted a link to all of the images frame by frame from that recap if you want to go check them out. Now let's dive into the season two teaser portion of that. We have here a picture which is 11, probably 12 riders on horseback. It's near what is most likely Fame based off of other pictures we've seen. And, you know, maybe this could be Leandrin and Egwene with their company heading over to Fame after leaving the White Tower. We then have this shirtless, shaved, and broody Rand, probably in the beginning of season two during his walkabout. And in a turn of events that honestly I'm not too thrilled about, back to Shamael, it being revealed in this teaser that the person we thought was the Dark One was in fact not the Dark One in season one, as Maureen is narrating now and later, eh, I thought they would play with it a little bit more for the reveal with the characters in season two. Like, you know, they think they killed the Dark One and then there's still stuff happening and like why, but you know, here we go. We know it's Ishamaya. Or as she goes on to say, the Dark One's strongest lieutenant. We see Rand here with his eyes closed and then opening them. Maybe he's waking up from a dream. We know Ishamayel, aka Balzaman, like to play with Rand's dreams. We have Moraine acting as our narrator again with a person who is probably Ishmael walking up some stairs and then grasping hands with a blood-soaked woman. And at this point is when it says one of the Dark One's strongest lieutenants. Now, could she be talking about the man or the woman there? Because we know Lanfear is like second only to Lutheran and maybe even Ishamael himself. Now we cut over to an image of 11 cloaked figures plus Ishamael seated around a circular table here. Around the outside of the room, we have a bunch of fireplaces and little alcoves and on the left there, it looks like it could be a door. Moraine again is narrating, he could be waking the Forsaken. Now, I think that's just, you know, them trying to play with us here. I don't think this is actually Forsaken at this table, or maybe they're not all Forsaken. Ishamael for sore is, and the others could be more chosen as they like to refer to themselves, but I don't think they all are. What I think is likely happening here is an adaptation of what the book fandom likes to refer to as the Dark One Social, which is a meeting that occurs at the beginning of book two, the Great Hunt. Ishamael is still disguised as Baalzaman and he gives orders to a bunch of dark friends from many walks of life. This part is written through the eyes of one of those dark friends. Pictured here could be many different types of people. We can't really tell much from this image. This is the best one that we could find, by the way. The first impressions and guesses that I would make right off the cuff are perhaps two blue sisters, maybe, sitting here because we could see blue clothing and maybe a ring on, on the finger, followed by what appears to be a man in similar garb to Ishamayel. You could see the cuff and the coat, and then mirrored by another man seated directly opposite him is the same cuff and coat type of thing, though they do seem to be wearing black gloves. Beside him is someone I can't really make out, but they're kind of small, maybe a child, which would be odd. 
then onto a larger person wearing maybe bracers, could be a soldier, maybe that's one of the Faldarans. The next person has pristine white gloves pulled all the way up to the elbow. That screams white cloak to me. The next person is a person with darker skin and looks like it could be a ring. Maybe it's Pat and Fane. We know he has a couple of rings and he has those long fingers. I just, I just picture Pat and Fane, I'm sorry. It could be an Aes Sedai though. Then we have one that I really can't discern much from. And lastly, beside Ishamael, looks like a red poofy dress maybe under that cloak. Maybe a red Aes Sedai. Maybe Kate Fleetwood is Leandrin, who knows? Some of these people have their hands on the table while some do not. I don't know if maybe like they're voting for something or whatever, but you know, leave it to Rafe to do weird little things like that. Now we have Uno or Guy Roberts definitely being forced to kneel. He would never just kneel to the Shaunchen. In the far background here, we could see Loyal, a face that I can't really make out, but could be Ingtar. And we see someone kind of peeking around the shoulder there. My initial thought was Egwene, but honestly, I'm not sure. And then that last man with the white shirt also is just, I have no idea. We also have two very distinctly different Shaunchen soldiers here. We have the rank and file here that just kind of have swords and cudgels. And then we have these others that are kind of on the right hand side of this picture. Maybe they're Death Watch guards, perhaps, because they're very different. The tassels are, are mentioned in the book with them and their armor looks a lot more like that carapace or insect-like armor that we hear about in the books. The last person in this picture is this woman on the left-hand side here, all in white with white painted on her head, it seems, and something in her mouth. Thinking it could be a member of the blood, they wear weird stuff or maybe one of their voices since there's, you know, an emphasis on wearing something in their mouth. Now we have a shot of Perrin and Loyal also probably being forced to kneel. And it looks like it's probably right around the time of that last picture we just watched. And now here we have a look at Donald Flynn as Matt Cawthon, who from what I've seen so far, honestly, I like. He's got a mixture of good looks and like a ruffian that I can get behind. And let's hope it's a smooth transition. And I've said this before, we really wish nothing but the best for Barney Harris, and I hope he's well, but I'm looking forward to see Donald Flynn in action. Now we have a better look at this masked Shaunchen woman that we've seen in earlier stuff. I still suspect this is Seroth. Now keen observers here will notice in these few images that she seems to have the long fingernails on both of her fingers, which is weird, and because, mainly because they're just so long. Next up is Moraine and Lan. Moraine is back again to narrate, shouting, Probably at land directly in this scene, you have no concept of the power they wield. My initial thought here is that she's speaking of the Chosen or the Forsaken and how powerful they are in the One Power. Now we have more of those ornate Shaunchen soldiers, the Death Watch Guard, I'm pretty sure. Now this image is, I'm 90% sure, I've zoomed in a bunch and I've looked around, is probably Ayula Smart, aka Avienda. She looks great if that is her. Anyway, there's, there's a kind of like a long sequence here of Lan seeming to be training with the sword shirtless. But I think this could be a adaptation of the accepted test that Nynaeve goes through while she's in the White Tower. from go And that's going from a novice to an accepted, which is the step just before you be one would become an Aes Sedai. Which leads us to this next image of Nynaeve and what looks like could be Maxim in the background. Now Maxim is one of Alana Sedai's warders. And his real name is Taylor Napier. You should go check out Dragon Mount's interview with Taylor Napier over on our YouTube page. Now, Nynaeve seems to be fighting with a sword here, which is out of character for her. But, you know, she seems pretty skilled with it. And I'm not sure what's going on. Either she's still in the accepted test. And in the books, we know she's not allowed to channel while in there. So it could make sense that she's using a sword. Or since she has a block in the books that only enables her to channel when she's angry, that could have manifested now in the show and they're trying to do something to make her angry. Now we have Moiraine clutching a dagger here, hiding it looks like she's looking over her shoulder. Now, I think this is going to be part of a scene of, with a cloaked figure that we're gonna see in a minute and who we saw more in the other season two teaser that was shared. As Rafe promised, more Shaunchen. If I had a guess, I would say that's Lord Turok, the leader of the Shaunchen's first invasion forces. Here again, we can kind of see where he's kind of crossing over his face here. He's got the two sets of long fingernails. It's, it's really weird how long they are, but you know, I can't wait to see how they manage that, especially if he's gonna be sword fighting with Rand later. Here we have Egwene, possibly in novice white, maybe in the tower. 
Now the narrator shifts over to Ishamayel. The first thing we have him saying is the only way to stop all this suffering. And now what's the suffering he could be talking about? Now, it could be anything, and it could be reference to pretty much the rest of the pictures here. There's a lot of suffering going on. For instance, Matt here, which Rafe and Cass refer to him as being imprisoned in the White Tower, most likely, I think, waiting to be cleansed of the dagger's influence. That being the dagger he stole from Shadow Logoth, which was later stolen from him by Padan Vane. Something I ought to mention here is that there was another clip shown only for those in attendance at Comic-Con. I'm told it was of Leandrin and Matt during a scene that looks like this, where Matt is being held in the White Tower. It's probably being questioned by Leandrin uh, about Rand or the entire group really, and uh, his connection to the dagger. Now we have Loyal being attacked probably in Fame, but another tidbit Rafe let go during the panel was that season two was gonna cover all the way to the end of book three. In other interviews we've seen with the cast, they did say that they moved major plot points though for season two from the books that they've adapted. So my guess here is that we will see the Battle of Fame, but probably not going to see the entirety of the story from book two. So no Stone of Tear just yet. The only reason I mention that is because there is a scene in book three that I feel like this image also kind of looks like, which is Loyal and a group from the Two Rivers fighting Trollocs outside of the city of Kyrian in the Foregate, which is kind of like a makeshift city that's just outside one of the gates of Kyrian. And the Trollocs kind of have these poles with ropes on them that they throw around Loyal. And that's kind of what this looks like. Now, here's that shot of Maureen in the bath again, crying, maybe about her loss of Sidar or the failing relationships that we're told she's going to have. Or maybe it's just confronting House Damadrid's past, you know, the fallen house. Now, as beautiful as Yosha is in this scene, uh, he doesn't look happy to be there. And remember, enthusiastic consent people, let's not get too hot for the, you know, torture that's going on here, probably. Though for Sirius, in my opinion, I think this is going to be a dream sequence. I think the imagery that's supposed to be represented here is that Rand is, you know, bound to the Wheel of Time or bound to fate and that he doesn't have much of uh, free will. And I think maybe this could be, you know, Ishamayo playing with Rand's dreams. Next, we have scared uh, or an end or angry Perrin after the fight at Fame, probably. He could be maybe seeing Egwene Collard here. That would be pretty rough on him. Got Uno, aka Guy Roberts, who is a pretty cool dude, by the way. I had a chance to chat with him on Twitter, and he's just really chill and a huge fan of the series. He said he's been reading it his whole life. Now, what we could see in the background here as a Shanshan soldier kind of wrenches somebody is white or grayish locks flipping up over the person's head. Now, I think this could be Elias based off of this picture. Now, this picture is of Perrin and company as they hunt for the horn. We can see, yes, there is a merdral pinned to the door there, but that person on the left, I think is Elias and back to the locks again. That's why I think that's Elias. From what we've heard, Elias is going to be filling the role of the character Hurin from the books. I'm looking forward to some more wolfiness, so I really hope that this is Elias. Oh man, Suan Sanjay, the Amaralyn seat. She has a deep closet, deep. All of her clothes are stellar, on point. The hat's a little weird though, big and floofy, but you know, it's got all those little seashell adornments and it's referencing her background as a fisherman's daughter from Tyr. Pretty cool. Ishamayel is back narrating again to finish the only way to end all the suffering is to stop the wheel itself. Now, this idea of ending suffering by ending time and rebirth and the wheel of time is something that we heard earlier in season one from Dana, the dark friend innkeeper who tries to trap and kill Matt and Ran. These next two are of some more Shanshin fighting with Faldarans and company. In the foreground, I think this could be Ingtar based off of the armor. And right over here again, in the back, we can see long kind of gray locks again. Still, I think more evidence of Elias. So I felt this next one needed more than just an image. So I made this gif of Egwene, probably just after being collared, or at least not long after. She looks like she might be in a cell based off of that stonework in the background. If the, if the way the rest of the cast spoke about Madeline or Egwene's acting in this season, she better win some sort of award, an Emmy or a Golden Globe or something. Now, this image is honestly a little bit of a mystery to me. Obviously, white cloaks on horseback. At first, I thought maybe they were charging. But if you look, 
no helmets, no drawn weapons, and all of the shields are, you know, on their back. And also the gates are open. So this one's a little bit of a mystery. What do you guys think this is? Here's our cloaked figure from the image that I talked about earlier of Moraine with the dagger. Who is that cloaked figure? Could be a Merdral. Definitely not someone Moraine is happy to see. Now we have more Shanchen on the move, and then a particular Shanchen who is not having a very good day. A keen observer in my live did point out that those doors that he's slamming shut, plus the ropes, they do resemble the doors from the season one when the Shanchen come out. So if you go back and look at that, you could see they look very similar. So shout out to that person. I could not find their name when I went back in chat logs, but you know who you are. So there were, like I said, two clips that were shared at Comic-Con that only the people in the audience got to see. Not even if you bought a virtual ticket did you get to watch it. There's been no word whether they're going to share them, you know, on the internet anywhere. But we were told that one was of Matt being imprisoned in the tower, as the cast said, and being questioned by Leandrin. The second was a much shorter clip of Kira Covini just before she came out on stage of Elaine Tracken. Now, a lot more of my apprehension for season two has been abated with these images and the words from the cast during this panel as well as from producer Kathy and I's conversation with Daniel and Rami Park, who direct and write for the Wheel of Time Origins shorts on Amazon Video. I say that mainly because Rami Park joined Rafe in the writer's room for season three, and from all that I heard from her during our interview, she, she is fantastic, the right person for this job, and I can't wait to see her influence on the script. Check the notes below for all of the links to that audio podcast or the visual podcast if you prefer. And the only apprehension I have now is, when are we gonna get more? When are we gonna know when the dates are? During the panel, Rafe actually said, the actual trailer are a ways off. So only the turning of the wheel will tell. Now, that's all I have for you today. Let me know what you think. How did you like our theorizing? Tell me in the comments below, did I miss anything? And we'll see you all next time. And that's our show. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, please subscribe, hit the like button, give us a thumbs up or leave us a comment. We love comments, especially positive ones. And if you have any friends that are interested in the Wheel of Time, please share some of our videos with them. And as always, a huge thank you to our sponsor, Tor Books, as well as our amazing Patreon community. And if you are interested in learning about how more of this show was made or some Wheel of Time insights, you too can become a member of the Patreon community. And as always, follow us on Dragon Mount with social media. And thank you so much for watching.